That's great. Thank you so much, Sarah. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. Could we have the first slide, please? We're, um, we're gathered together at a conference called Modernisms Inside and Out. But I was thinking that if I wanted to work with that phrase so that it captures what I want to share with you about Emily Carr's landscapes, I'd be tempted at least at first to give that phrase a kind of temporal spin, something like modernisms then and now probably. Because a point that I wanna make about Carr's landscape paintings is that they don't just reflect the modernity of her time, though, though they do that, but of ours as well. And most, more specifically, what Carr achieved in her late oil and gasoline landscapes is germane to us now as we endeavor to reckon with the repercussions of her modernity. So what was Carr's project? She wrote in her diary that her goal was to capture the hum of life that binds us to the world. In works like the one that I'm showing you from 38 or 39, she was trying to give pictorial form to her experience of, and I'm quoting her, a breath that draws your breath into its breathing, a heartbeat that pounds on yours, a recognition of the oneness of all things. So language like that came to Carr as she was reflecting in her, on her hours in the forest or at the seashore. And her focus on the natural world fits super well with the nation's emerging wilderness paradigm, making her a prime exponent, as we know, of Canadian modernism. By the postmodern 1990s, however, Carr's thinking on those matters was increasingly dismissed as a doomed instantiation of an obsolete, naive, and misguided romanticism. Her critics argued that she was more than usually prey to self-deception, in that she mistook her own passions and concerns for insight into the world itself. Carr may have thought she was disclosing the very truth of nature, but wasn't it the case that all she was really showing us was her own desire? How could we take seriously her belief in the oneness of all things when the rapidly industrializing world that she was living in heaped alienation upon alienation? Over time, however, I've come to think that it's not quite right to talk about paintings like this one as Carr's attempts to disclose the truth of the natural world. Now that may have been her starting point. Next slide, please. The uh, glowing core at the heart of this forest does record her belief as she held it in the late 1920s that nature had a secret that it was her job to uncover. But actually, it didn't take her very long to get past that idea. And by the time she was painting works like this next one, next slide, please, Carr's project was quite different, as you can see just by looking at the work. Her art wasn't so much about revelation as it was a means of sharpening her awareness of an immediate and really quite a reciprocal presence of herself and her world. So what do I mean when I say that? I mean that it only really makes sense to critique Emily Carr as projecting herself onto the world around her. And that is was what was at the heart of that critique. If we assume that individuals exist as entities who are separate from the world that we inhabit. And that, it comes to me, is a very modern assumption. The modernity of the 20th century was heavily predicated on breaking existence down into discrete units. You know, whether we're talking about time or atoms or work processes on the Henry Ford production line. But today we see the pendulum swinging in the opposite direction. We're moving towards networks, ecologies, interconnectednesses. And as we become increasingly aware of ourselves as environmental entities, Carr's work begins to make a new kind of sense to us. 
not as a projection of human desire onto a natural world that she was alienated from, but an expression of our own human imbrication in the meshwork of existence. So am I talking about Carr as an environmental hero then? I certainly wouldn't be the first to make that claim, but I would want to insist too on this, that Carr's meditations on trees and oceans weren't enough all on their own to really enable her to capture that meshwork of life. She needed gasoline too. For once she began thinning her house paint with gasoline, only then did Carr's medium become really malleable enough to be an interlocutor for her. And it's only then I think that her paintings became convincing records of her philosophy of life. Oneness of self and world, Emily Carr had it, but not with the trees. She had it with her paint. And I have no doubt that her time in the forest was a key agent in that transformation. It's certainly where she cultivated her intensive practice of sensory attunement. And it was that practice of sensory attunement that enabled her to appreciate the enmeshed nature of reality. But what she ultimately bequeathed to us is a quite different meshwork, that of artist and paint, gesture and brush, pressure and flow and oil and gasoline. And I think that that is not a failing of her environmental project, but a mark of its success. You know, there's a vein within current ecological thought that advocates that we should really abandon the concept of nature altogether on the basis that somehow we human beings, when we talk about nature, we always set it up somewhere over there, exterior to us, separate from us. When the gas station and the hardware store intervened in cars production, they conjoined with her own agency to produce a refusal of the divided vision of existence that separates humans from our environment. In this case, the environment of her medium. Only now in this really late phase of our modernity are we really beginning to fully grasp the value of that insight. Our modernity now looks different from the modernity then. And part of that difference is, I think, exactly this 21st century recognition of the interconnected nature of existence. And so that's the aspect of Carr's landscapes that resonates most for me today. So in conclusion, if I go back to the actual title of this conference, Modernisms Inside and Out, I guess I actually do see Carr's landscapes in that title after all, because they prompt us to attend to our senses as one way of working through and overcoming the alienations of the interior self and the exterior world that modernity continues to inflict on us. Thank you very much.